Hi, and welcome to another episode of Ecom at One. Today's guest, Dan Saunders, Retail and E-commerce Manager at Black & Decker. How are you doing, Dan? I'm good, Richard. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Well, it's been a long time coming. We've been trying to get Dan on the show for some time, and I really, really appreciate it, Dan. Really, really appreciate you giving us the time today um, to step through step through what you're doing at Black & Decker. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, no worries. I'm pleased to be here. Brilliant. So I think it'd be good to kick off. Tell us about Black & Decker and how you managed to secure that position from an agency background. I think we have a lot of people that listen to the show that are e-commerce, but they're also agency, you mm. know, they're, you know, and I think there's quite a lot of... Um, a lot of um, sort of chatter at the moment, agency staff moving to, to in-house positions and things like that. So I think it'd be good to, you know, we'll start there if that's all right. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the whole idea of changing from uh, agency to in-house was more to do with uh, with my little boy uh, being born. Yeah. Um, uh, previous to this, like my agency life was to generate the new business side of things. So you're either on the phone or you're out in meetings all the time. And yeah. because I spent so much time researching different SEO, PPC, CRO techniques, I used to get sent to quite a lot of conferences to speak at as well. I mean, I'm never going to lie. I, you know, I won't lie. It's uh, it was a really glamorous lifestyle, but it's just not conducive to when you've got a family. Yes. Um, so I got I got really lucky. Um, one of the VPs at uh, Black and Decker, uh, Dean. Um, uh, uh, Dean McClee, uh, he um, he asked, he saw this this role, the uh, the role that I'm in now, and he said, you know what, you should apply for that because I pitched him so many times. He knew I knew what I was doing, but <laughs> trying to uh, trying to get through um, uh, trying to get through some of the processes was just a bit of a nightmare for him. So he was like, you know what, you should come on, you should do this as well. So uh, met the team that I'm working with now, and I haven't looked back since. Yeah. It was wow. an interesting change. It was definitely interesting. You actually pitched them many times and then obviously built that relationship with that uh, potential client. And then he's like, hey, we've got a role what we, that we think oh, we know. Yeah. Well, it, it was when uh, he and was he, actually... He did the uh, reverse pitch on you and pitched you. Basically, yeah. It was, it was when he was working at, uh, at Kellogg's. Uh, so um, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was through there and he just started here. He's like, you know what? Our UK team needs someone like you to help, uh, especially with the Amazon yeah. side of things. And it was like, uh, yeah, I mean, it just it just it seemed to fall into place just really well for me. Yeah. So, how long were your agency side for then? Uh, my entire digital career, actually. So, I'd say what so about three, four years. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, uh, yeah, it was yeah. In, it's interesting from branded three to uh, ingenuity digital. Um, really, really good brands to work with. And if I can, uh, I'd still send stuff to ingenuity digital. But uh, you see where all the branded three are now. I mean, obviously, you had Steve over a little while ago. Uh, from Rise at Seven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant. That was a brilliant episode, actually. One of the a real good, real standout episode, actually. But yeah, it's an interesting chat because I think obviously we've I've been agency for well, we would just celebrated our twelfth birthday with one of our agencies, and oh wow, obviously, obviously we've had, yeah, we've seen quite a lot of things come and go. Yeah. Yeah. world and, and, and people from agency to in-house and then people going from in-house to agency you know and that you know we've had people come here they've then got oh well you know we want to work i would like to you know want, want to move on and want, want to work in-house and absolutely you know fantastic but then they sort of some of them come knocking on the door a couple of years later um got any positions i'm, I'm mm. about to come back you know and but obviously i think it's it's great that people try the, the different sides you know because ultimately it's very very different isn't it agency life is usually you know you've got x amount depending on what you're doing in an agency mm-hmm. if you've got front facing in your account manager for example or in sales you know you're dealing with a lot of different businesses you know a lot of a lot of things in flow um, whereas I'm um, working for one company, obviously it's very focused, but you're still doing a lot of things, but it's very much focused on that one company. So how did you find the transition? You know, how have you found it? Yeah, it's, it's like you say, it's very, very different. Um, I think one of the things that you have to get used to is the priority sort of change. From outside looking in, I sort of said, actually, we should be doing this, 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 and this. But then when you've got this sort of, you know, the thing with the global company is everyone's got a different list of priorities. So yeah. it doesn't matter if you're, quite new to the business or you've been with them you know uh, 15 20 years you know i've, I've actually found out uh, there's uh, some people in our sales team that have been with the company uh, over 50 years 50 it was 50 yeah five zero and i just, <laughs> I, was just I was sort of just in awe bless them, wow. they, were still, they were still out on the road and i was just like you know what i just, I just don't I, just, I don't think i could take it I, you know i like being on the road but yeah do I want to do that in the next 50 years time? I, I don't think I've got the stamina for it, mental or physical. <laughs> is, is, is it like a generation thing as well, isn't it? Mm. You know, like, like our type of business, digital, it's very, I always refer to it as very transient. You know, you mm. can obviously mm. with a laptop, work for anybody, and even more so now than, you know, just two years ago, obviously COVID and all that's changed a lot of things, you know. Mm. But, 
competing for to 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 get staff within your business it was more of a locality thing wasn't it you know if exactly. you're lead chef exactly. in lincoln new york whatever you'd work within you know five ten miles of that office you know and then you well actually it's the best place to work for in sheffield or wherever it may be you know L london wherever it would be whereas now you know it's um everyone's getting dm left right and center from San Francisco from yeah. New York, you know, whatever it may be. So uh, the world has, has changed massively, hasn't it? And obviously uh, the opportunity. Exactly. I mean, like uh, Dean's in Ireland, but I'm I'm in Doncaster. And I don't think either of us would have had been able to get these jobs if it, yeah. uh, if it wasn't for the, the fully remote option that yeah. they offer for us as well. And I mean, as you see, you're in a nice clean office, which I do miss having that. I do miss having free tea as opposed to having to go downstairs <laughs> to make it every <laughs> so often. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, coming from you live from my my son's room because that's currently the office and it's yeah. like it's all for that. Well, it's just like this this podcast when we launched, you know, it was the, the idea was very much that everyone would come here, you know, mm. to the office. We've got a bit of a podcast studio here. You know, we we did have we sort of disbanded that now really in in, in the way that it was you know it was it was geared up for you know a nice um you know physical space to come into. We did probably eight episodes here at the right at the beginning. You know, and then COVID sort of happening, kicking in, starting to it's like, whoa. So obviously then it's like, right, I'm in my I'm in my kitchen with my laptop with no kit, basically, really. You know, and then and then it opened up the world of any guests, you know, which it would have done anyway, obviously, mm, but mm. that really wasn't the focus then. So so what would you say has been the biggest differences you've noticed then working um, you know, um so working in an agency and now working in-house, you know, what's some of the sort of day-to-day -day things that you've noticed? So yeah, in terms of the day-to-day -day things, I mean, it's it's quite similar because obviously I've got I work with all our retail clients, so it is kind of similar to the agency side that you know you have to make sure you dedicate a certain amount of times, uh, you know, but there's no um, no system to log it into, there's no line manager or lead to say, oh, I've, you know, if you you've not spent an hour on this account or anything like that, it's, yeah, it's about uh, the benefits and the similarities are that you know you're still having to deal with different people, different priorities with different agencies. Um, interesting thing is that i'm actually speaking to other digital agencies that work for some of our clients and i'm trying yeah, to liaise yeah. with them and yeah. uh they're trying to get back to me and i empathize with them but yeah it's it's more around the priority so i came in and said right we need to change this 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 and this it was more around the seo content what we do with ppc how can we improve cro yeah uh, how can we prove uh, this on our websites but then not cannibalize what we put on uh, our clients yeah so that to me was yeah. the biggest priority uh, but then when you actually step into it, uh, you know, there's uh, a system, you know, Stanley Black and Decker have grown to what they are because they've got the strong processes in place and they know they know the business a lot better than I do. I'm, I'll be honest with you. When I first started the role, I couldn't have told you uh, the difference between a hammer drill, an impact drill or just your, your typical drill. I just couldn't have told you any of those things. <laughs> these people, these people, these people know this stuff inside out and they yeah. it, was, it was interesting to go from a side where agency side was I was a case of right. In my agency job is right i'm going to do this 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 and this as long as i hit my target everyone's fine yeah but in this case it was a case of right what have i got uh from our global team our central team our northern team and then what have i got from the actual clients to sort of liaise between that as well so things that i initially you know if i'd gone back six months ago and you told me about this role i always said you know these these things they aren't priorities but the things that i'm working on now are are massively important for our customers so it's a case of well actually if it's important for our customers, it's important for us. And uh, yeah, it's interesting sort of that shift in yeah. perspective. I've whereas it's agency, I had to account for every minute of every day. What are you doing? What's yeah. you, doing? you know, you've got to you've got to log your time against something. Um, but here it's a case of as long as you as long as you get it done. Yeah. Um, there's actually a, a part of my email, uh, uh, my email that actually says, you know, I I can work remotely. I I choose to work inside these hours, but I don't expect you to uh, reply outside of your normal work hours as well because yeah. Yeah, um yeah. what i tend to do is you know start at half past eight log off about five have a bit of time with the family and then if there's anything in depth that i need to get done i can then do it after that and as long as i i'm keeping to uh you know times time frames set and everything along those things everyone's happy yeah. as long as it's on that time as well i would imagine that um just guess yeah i think mean, that's great but i think obviously spending many, many years in agency, you know, big agencies in the UK, um, mm -hmm. um, working, you know, with a lot of brands to obviously win their business and then develop their strategy to then go to Black & Decker and then work with your partners. I would imagine you're bringing some huge value. They're probably a bit like, oh my God, this guy really knows his stuff. <laughs> you're probably, I can imagine they're like, wow, okay. We never thought, you know, you mentioned like cannibalization and mm. 
you know, I can imagine obviously you're bringing the huge value of that knowledge of a lot of lot of other websites that obviously you've worked on or worked with, you know, uh, for many many years, and then um, bringing a real. So I know you've not been there that long. You know, you've uh, you've had a um, you know a sort of a whirlwind sort of um, few months, but how would you say Black & Decker have managed to navigate um, sort of the changes of the last couple of years, last 18 months with COVID? How have they managed to do so well? I think, uh, anyway, I'm going to sound a little bit biased. They've uh, they've done really well. With the, I mean, there's some things they could have done better, but there's a lot yeah. of things that would have involved foresight. You know, it's um, uh, obviously uh, 20, hindsight's 2020. There's no one that could have predicted. There's, there's some, um, there was, you know, issues in terms of logistics, but that's for everybody that worked in e-commerce, right? Everyone had issues with uh, logistics, uh, parts uh, not being able to be made or uh, components not being able to make. So um, there's that element of it, but everyone makes those, made those mistakes and it's something we all learn from. Where they've done really well is adapted to, you know, the fully remote structure. You know, like I said, I, I wouldn't have been able to hear, uh, one of my global VPs wouldn't be able to work with us because, you know, where he's based. Being yeah. fully remote, uh, that's been really, really useful. And then how we've adapted with our clients as well. So we're still making sure that they're, before they're still getting to test the product but in it's still in a covid safe environment as well you know i was supposed to be meeting a client um on uh, tu- uh, on on uh, next week tuesday next week um but uh, they've they've rearranged it because of uh, you know different covid legislations for different countries and it was yeah. like well, you know what let's, let's pick this up in, in the next couple of weeks when we see where the the land lies so stanley black and decker have done really well in the fact that they've been um reactive and uh, programmatic with it as well. Sorry, not programmatic, uh, progressive with it. So it's a case of, uh, sorry, went straight back into display. <laughs> like, Agency days. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, been really progressive in the fact that, you know, they've taken everything on the chin and they've adapted yeah. with it. But then they've also sort of set, right, okay, this is where they've done it. And then the, the final thing as well, where I think they've done really well is that they've offered quite a lot of um, mental health training yeah. for, uh, for a lot of staff, you know, for the management to, how so they can help with the staff, how they can spot these things, uh, all the way down to on our on our Teams chats, uh, people have got tags that say, you know, I'm a mental health supporter, please feel free to talk with me. And someone that's suffered with their mental health for, for decades, that sort of strong support network behind it is, yeah, absolutely fantastic. And it's, it's very rarely seen, especially in the UK at the moment, it's really, really rarely seen there. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, 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 that's amazing to hear. I think, um, so obviously, the types of products you sell, I assume, have been very, very popular because people are locked down, and it's like, what we're going to do with my time? You know, I've, mm-hmm. I seem to have uh, a newfound love for my lawn in the last eighteen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've spent. I actually have four lawn mowers in my in my garden. Excellent. <laughs> you know, I, I I dreamt of having four BMWs like ten years ago, fifteen years ago. <laughs> that didn't quite happen. It is now like a. You know, a, a ten inch cut, a twenty inch cut, a red. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, I think similar to in Black and Decker's sense, um, obviously a lot of DIY, a lot of home improvements. Mm. Um, but obviously, that's led on to then a lot of issues with supply and you know demand outstripping supply. Mm. Is there anything particularly there that Black and Decker have done to sort of um, try and improve that supply chain? Is there any? any you know, that's probably a bit of a tricky question, but um, you know, I think that's been a from our agency standpoint, you know, mm. when, we, when we first went into lockdown, you know, obviously it's like, what the hell is going to happen? And what we found was that the, the challenges we had as an agency was that, that our clients, that their main challenge mm. was supply. So we had examples of clients doing ridiculously well. It's like Roas was incredible. The number, everything was just unbelievable. And we were like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. You know, and then they'd ring up, say, stop everything. <laughs> You're like, what? what? What are you talking about? <laughs> We haven't got anything to sell, you know, and, it, and, and you know, there's no, but there's no, you know, the the cost of freight and um, you know, getting, you know, and I know that's been a real up and down this last, you know, eighteen months where you know there's costs and, and everything. But as Black and Day, have you got any sort of advice or tips or anything there on that that supply chain? Uh, for the supply chain thing, what I think uh, Stanley Black and Decker have done really, really well with is managing customers' expectations. You know, everyone knows where we are with COVID, where we are with supply chains, yeah. HP, et cetera, et cetera. But saying to them, instead of saying to them, you know, typical sales guy is, yeah, come on, we're going to smash this. Here's, you know, here, we'll promise you these, they've got yeah. processes in place to make sure that if there's any promised stock, that it goes to that customer and that it's all distributed fairly. Yeah. Because you don't want to send uh, 2,000 uh, hammer drills to one customer and then one customer have absolutely nothing for it as well we've got, we've got all these different relationships yeah. and every 
and each you know each customer's got their own sales guy so it's a case of if i'd have been in that position it'd be like yeah i'm going to promise as much as i can to mine because that's it's my customer i want it to go really yeah, well everyone's got their different priorities sort of thing exactly so, exactly and it's just yeah. the managing of expectations and uh, how they keep them in the loop of right okay it's now been dispatched it's where you are uh it's where we are now this is where it is it should be yeah. with you at this time as well so the the managing of the expectations is is yeah. as best as it can be and then like you said the uh, trying to deal with it from an online perspective if someone goes onto our customer's website purchases something it's got to we've got to try and make sure that it fits within that uh that e-com space and of uh you know if someone pays for next day delivery our customers are able to have it there for yeah. next day delivery yeah. or, uh because as soon as as soon as you start messing with delivery times that yeah. conversion just goes away and then yeah. your customers and lifetime values just completely yeah, well, I, i've just had that with a product I've, I've just bought one of these fitness rings rather than a fitness watch and oh yeah yeah you know, it's, it should have arrived like 25th of november it was arriving 25th of november and it still isn't here and i've found out it's you know it's it's been delayed because of supply and this that and the other but they didn't tell me you know so it's like my my initial experience now is not great you know and this is a huge huge brand you know the probably the largest brand in the world uh, you know mm -hmm. with this type of product but it's just now my you know, brand opinion is very tarnished, unfortunately, already. But hopefully, I've had a ping to say it's been delivered while I've been sat here, actually. So, yeah, excellent. That's always good to hear. I think, yeah, for the guys that are listening in, obviously, um, you know, as, as store owners or managing the marketing of or running those stores, you know, there's expectations on the site. If you're saying next day delivery and you know down well that you haven't even got it in stock, you know, we have we obviously know there's instances of that out there and people trying to get the orders through. But really, that long-term um, reputation is more important than that quick win of a x amount of thousands in sales and uh which goes without saying but i do see you know i think um certain products particularly that are known to be hard to get like you know xboxes playstation that type of, you know or, you know i know the instances of, of people that are sort of taking orders for stock that they know they're not going to get for weeks it's just like whoa what are you doing so i think you know really managing that better um you know in those delivery times you know like black friday for example you know that's, mm. that's sort of been and gone obviously but you know, quite often people know they're not going to get all their orders out because it's like it's 10 times the normal demand but they're still saying yeah next day when they know they can't so just having those extra delivery options around busy seasonal times you know especially if you know you've not got it but even more so you know if you know right we can't actually get the orders out at the moment so yeah just managing those expectations that's a great one dan yeah brilliant so marketplace mm. place um what was so you want to step us through your marketplace strategy yeah, so um, my my speciality is within the Amazon side of things. Uh, you know, I've been selling on Amazon for since circa 2012. Uh, so it was it made sense for me to come in and uh, help uh, with the marketing element uh, for um, Standard Block and Decker's uh, Amazon. Yeah, uh, within the UK. Um, that again, obviously, we've had supply issues because Amazon wants a ton of products, and there's very little negotiating with uh, with Amazon because it is Amazon. But it's a case of again, we, we can't send. 20,000 drills to Amazon, but then not send them to one of our regular suppliers because it's just not. Yeah. yeah. So trying to manage that relationship uh, has been interesting. Luckily, that's not my job. That's the, our commercial team's job. But then the marketing element of it um, is more a case of making sure that we get the content right. Because um, one thing that you tend to find is there's quite a few different tools that will tell you keyword search volumes uh, for the Amazon products. But what people then think is, oh, you know what, I'm going to focus on this keyword because there's 3,000 searches a month for it on Amazon. But what they don't see is the keyword next to it, there's 50,000 searches a month on Google. And at the moment, uh, Google still provides 40% uh, plus of Amazon sales. Wow. So it's about trying to optimize for both and trying to find that balance. Oh, so you said uh, the search on Google and then end up on Amazon. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's it, because, they're, you know, uh, Amazon's, uh, Google's uh, biggest. Uh, supplier at the moment it's uh, you know it spends the most in terms of shopping ads it's yep. uh, because it's such a beast in itself it tends to rank quite highly anyway i mean the content scores aren't always great because you, you've given very low uh character fields yeah but it's about trying to find that balance between the two and that's where the real art of amazon seo is uh, to come in as well and then working with the ppc side of it as well making sure that it's that it's optimized in uh, a specific way because what i, I found uh, I still see with a lot of DIY brands, not just with us, is that um, when uh, when the uh, the DIY brand is trying to talk about the product, they'll talk about the product and they'll talk from it from a trade sort of standpoint. It was like, you know, like I said, I knew nothing about drills before, but yeah. now 
I spent so much time researching them. I hopefully I've got a good yeah. idea of it. Uh-huh. But in the case of say for Black and Decker, their customer base is someone like me, you know, someone that owns their own home, uh, doesn't really know a lot about trade. What would I be looking at in terms of search within Amazon? And then uh, uh, DeWalt- rather than a builder, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas DeWalt's uh, more trade professional. So they're gonna in some cases well, they're actually searching directly for the SKU code. Yeah. 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 Also. Yeah. So it gives you that sort of uh, that give, gives you that sort of balance between to work with those brands as well. Uh, in terms of other marketplaces, uh, we're currently uh, selling refurbished stock on eBay. Uh, Amy, who heads the team there, absolutely doing a, a fantastic job. She she only started in uh, January, but she, I mean she's been there longer than I have. But she only started in in January last year, um, and she's already uh, absolutely smashing it. Yeah. The, park. the things that she's able to deliver, the expertise that she's got, is absolutely insane. Yeah, that's brilliant. So just going back to the Amazon piece then. So obviously huge tra- um, traffic um, or it's a revenue generator. So just to clarify then, so optimizing those pages for more around uh, those product pages on Amazon um, around the sort of things that your customer, your typical customer. So in this case, we're not trying to target the builder, the craftsman, the professional. We're trying to target the you know, the, 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 the predominantly male, and not always male, I'm sure, obviously not, um, but um, UK, well, obviously depending on where you are, um, um, home owner, that's mm. the odd jobs, so very much looking at those Q&A, the type of things that they're looking for, you know, real, probably a, bit, a lot more basic understanding. Exactly that, and also you have to take into consideration, I know I know we're talking about Amazon, but the, the recent Google Eat update as well, I'm trying to include that eight content within the very fine limits that you get yep. with Amazon. Because you, you know, if someone puts in hammer drill into Google, you want it to be one of your products that yep. comes up on Amazon as well. Because it's still uh, you know, the the search metric, the search volumes behind the two are absolutely astounding because more people will put it into Google, then click the link, then go straight into Amazon. Yeah. Then come onto Amazon, put it in. Uh-huh. And go yeah. that way as well so trying to find that balance is, is the key uh the key element to it as well but like so trying to pull in everything that i i, I learned from google seo yeah. and google paid and google, google displayed as well because amazon's uh starting to take share within the displayed marketing yeah. Uh, yeah. advertising as well people spent less in 2020 with google and spent more with amazon so that's uh that's that just gives you an idea of how the market shifted so when you're when you're researching, you know, the hammer drill, for example, what's your go to sort of right? You sat there now. I'm just thinking of our listeners. They're listening now, and thinking, okay, I've got my products on Amazon. I'm, I'm going to look at the the content side. But what's your sort of? Have you got a go to tool set that you right hammer drill, or you're trying to find topics? Are you using certain? You know, we've we've had um, Randon from Spark Toro talking about. Oh right, yeah, yeah. We've also had people from SEM Russia, you know, and so forth. Have you got like a right? You sat there now. You you know, you've got a new drill come out, you know, or coming out. You know, what's your, you know, step us through that process. Yeah, well, we actually have got a new, <laughs> a new drill coming out. And I'll talk about, I can talk about the range a little bit later. But um, uh, the keyword research behind it, um, for me, um, I always like to go very, very basic with these things. Uh, typical, uh, you know, like I said, STEM rushes, uh, year age, age refs. Um, um, I tend to heavily use uh, Google Keyword Planner a lot more. Um, I use it for my own account as well, because like I say, when I'm uh, from the consulting side, I've got a nice variety within it. So it's it's got a, it's got a healthy search on it as well. Uh, more specifically around um, uh, Amazon, I tend to use a tool called uh, CellZone, uh, which is actually powered by SEMrush. Uh, I'm one of the beta testers. Yeah, yeah I know that one, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's really, really useful because it gives me everything from uh, how well is your PPC campaign running? Uh, you can do split testing on it as well, which is uh, you can do split testing on a regular Amazon account, but Amazon picks the products that you can use it on. Whereas uh, with the sales zone tool, you can actually uh, select the product you want to do and you can have tests running side by side. Uh, you can do traffic analysis. So where I've just said actually quite a lot of our traffic comes through Google to Amazon. I could then say to you, actually, this product doesn't have a lot of traffic coming to it from Google. It doesn't have a lot of traffic coming from Amazon. Where it's got is referrals. So whereas someone's written a blog about this product and then put the yeah. link to it and pulled it across that way. And you can even see what the paid advertising was. The, the full tool set to me is yeah. absolutely invaluable. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I've got quite a few more tools than some on the standard market at the moment, but the ones that I'm base testing at the moment with them, it's a really exciting time to be getting into Amazon and the, the, the support wow. there for you is absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. We're hearing that more and more, to be fair. Yeah, we've had a couple of um, FBA guys on recently and, you know, some last episode a couple of weeks ago and 
Great. Okay. So obviously you are selling B2B, you know, and not B2C on your site. Do you think that'll ever change or is there any plans for that to change or, and if not, why not? Yeah, I, I can imagine it will. Um, it's more of a case, of, again, with you being a global operation, things don't tend to work as quickly as we would with an agency. Yeah. If we say, if I said at Engineers Digital, this company needs a new website, we'd say, right, okay, let's let's get on yeah. to it. Here is a case of it doesn't go just through the Northern team, it has to go through the EMA uh, NZ team, and then it again goes to the global and goes through the sign-off there. Um, because they've got such a strong history with B2B, uh, the D2C project is, isn't going to be a priority just because Again, we don't want to be competing with our own own clients. You know, I don't want to be running SEO on our yeah. site and thinking, oh, flipping heck, I can't, I can't use this yeah. metadata or I can't use this photo yeah. because yeah. it's going to cannibalize it. Um, I, I imagine they will be doing in the not too distant future. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the DC project at the moment, um, I think we've got the closest thing we've got is with Amazon, but again, we sell to, we're a vendor with Amazon still gives us that flavor and what we're doing with eBay gives us good insights to what yeah. our customers want in. And because our customers at the moment are quite happy with what they've got, if they weren't happy with an aspect, I think that would speed the project up. Yeah. As, as it stands, our customers are happy with what they've got and it just doesn't yeah. make sense. Whereas uh, people like uh, Dyson or Shark Hoovers, they could see a gap in their market for where they needed it. We've just not seen that gap. And we got, you got to go where the data tells you. I know yeah. it sounds, and it sounds very much like a, a government brief, briefing there but it's, <laughs> there's, there's no point in doing anything without the data is uh you could just jump on this you know because everyone i can see uh, a lot of people in development that said oh we've got to jump on dc dc is the next big thing dc is a big thing but it's it's got to be the right time for the right people yeah as well and i see it a lot you know a lot of our clients in our agency you know they have brands you know and we're representing the brand and they have obviously a network of um um, whether that's distributors or retailers in e-commerce stores and then they're sort of tempted by the shiny lights of um, having their own mm -hmm. store and obviously but then obviously you've got a whole network of whether that's 10 or ten thousand, you know mm -hmm. um, retailers and obviously upsetting that channel you know and then it then it becomes right about a pricing thing but that's very challenging and there's, there's a whole conversation there about um what you can and can't do with um pricing um exactly. yeah exactly. so so your stance at the moment is very much well your your b2c is amazon mm -hmm. uh, and it'll potentially stay out like of that for some time because it's not it's not straightforward to just overnight you know you know in an international company sort of flip that out yeah exactly and you think of how many brands we've got we've got so within uh stanley black decker it's uh stanley stanley fat max um black and decker obviously uh dewalt erwin uh you've got all those and then if you do one for one, you've got to do with them all, yeah. everybody else's. And yeah. just looking at some of the analytics on our own websites at the moment, it's not, uh, you, we're not seeing people bounce off our website because they can't purchase it. They're going to the sites where they've got familiarity. So whether it's your Argos, your Amazons, um, they're then going into uh, um, one, you know, to the drop down box that we've built to say, right, okay, actually this product is in stock in this, 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 oh, yeah. this location. Yeah. They go to that and they'll use a more familiar payment platform. Uh, this is why I see a lot of people adopting yeah. Google, uh, Amazon Pay. Yeah. Because yeah. everyone's so used to the Amazon format. They're like, oh, actually, yeah, I see this. This is fine. Done, done, dusted, yeah. and got it the next day. Or in some cases, you've got it five minutes later. But um, yeah. But yeah it's, it's, yeah, like I said, looking at the analytics and how people are on our website, to me, I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't go to my uh, managing director and say, yeah, I can fully justify your spending X amount on a website uh or just migrating them over to being dtc uh at the moment just because of where things are um brilliant so obviously we're not just talking about the uk we are mm -hmm. uh, you, you cannot, probably can't um go to many countries and not find a black and decker drill about 300 yards from where you are probably <laughs> in reality um or, or obviously add to other products um so what's been some of the biggest headaches that you've already sort of seen within to sort of market and promote brands internationally i think i know a lot of our listeners you know are in, obviously in multiple countries or very much thinking you know they're either right they're us based uk based you know and they're like right you know we want to open up into you know xyz what's some of the biggest things that you've seen as maybe you know potential problems and challenges or and advice that you would give to people looking at that sort of international piece the advice that i would give is make sure you've got key stakeholders uh you've got them you've got their ear um what i tend to do is i share a lot of uh, knowledge that i know is not within the company at the moment 
Uh, so when it comes to SEO, PPC, CRO, I get messages from all over the country, uh, all, all, all over the world. Yeah. But, well, mostly from the US or mostly from Europe, just asking, oh, Dan, can you look this over? What's your advice on that? So people know if it comes to that, Dan's the go-to guy for it at the moment. Yeah. Um, if, so as long as you can keep the ear of these decision makers, whether you're in a big multinational corporation or if it's just uh, a half a dozen of you, making sure you've got the ear of the key decision makers yeah. and you're backing it with data. Now, yeah. the best way to do this, I found, is people, uh, and this is, goes from right from C-suite down to people like me, not that I'm saying I'm an underling, but you know, everything that, people are motivated by one of three things, time, money, and resource. If you can see what the stakeholder wants out of those three, it's always going to be one of those three. If you can put your presentation with the data that supports that element, yeah, they'll be absolutely fine. I, at the moment, when I've tried to get things done, that's all I've done, yeah, and it works. Uh, it's worked for me at the moment. That's, yeah, that's brilliant advice, Dan. I really do. We, we had a very similar conversation yesterday with our SEO team. Not so much about international, but you know, very much. Obviously, you've got to make sure that the people that you know that the team above um, are aware of the value of what you're looking at is bringing, you know, and, and what, what it's going to cost, what the returns are going to be, the impact, you know, and that education piece. Whereas quite often they just, you know, they just hear there's this thing going on called SEO or this thing going on still, you know, we've had, we've had meetings over the years where I remember going into a meeting with an owner of a business, you know, who'd been paying for SEO for 10 years and then we we went into I went into a meeting with the owner, you know, sort of ten years, you know, later, if you like, after he'd been paying at other agencies and whatnot. And he goes, "So, um, what is this SEO thing then?" <laughs> and it's like, yeah. "Wow, you know." And I knew he'd spent, you know, probably half a million pounds on it. Yeah, he didn't know what it stood for, let alone what it did. <laughs> I've got to admit, before Steve Kenwright introduced me to it, I had to Google. What it was for, <laughs> that was uh, that was what my life was. I I was an estate agent uh, from. Uh-huh. The- before Steve uh, brought me into Branded 3. And yeah. he, said, uh, he says to me, um, yeah, Dan, have you ever thought about selling something other than houses? And I kind of thought I'd fallen into uh, a state yeah. agency because fell through being a doctor and a politician. But um, yeah. and I was kind of like just being an estate agent just to earn some money at the time. It's like, yes, every day for the last 12 years, I've thought about selling something other than houses. And <laughs> for my interview, I had to Google what it was. I'm thinking, oh, you know, it's just one, it's just one element. You know, he's a digital guy. It, it won't be that difficult. And I'm looking through it and I'm just like, I've got myself into it for a lot more. Um, but yeah, like you said, having that having that buy-in, uh, I tended to, uh, when I was in the new business side, always go for people like Dean, who were like senior vice presidents, who uh, who wouldn't have heard of SEO. I yeah. mean, Dean, Dean was, because he's, he's on top of it. He's been doing e-commerce for almost longer than I've been alive. So um, not a shot at your age, if you're watching this. <laughs> um, but um, from my perspective, it was a case of... Um, just going out to them and then talking to them and saying, look, you know, I've noticed this. Is this a big problem yeah. for you? If it is, let's talk. If not, sorry to have wasted your time. And I'm it's very important. good at sort of finding emails and numbers going out that way as well. But the higher you go, you've got to, the big thing I would always say as well for any anyone trying to get to these people is um, try and speak their language. Because as soon as you start talking about SEO, PPC or anything along those sort of lines, they just send you to who you sound like. So they'd send yeah. you to... Uh, a PPC person that they want to call with that might not be relevant at all, but then they'll just say to you, oh, we've got an agency or you're actually trying to take my job. Yeah. Or something yeah. like that. It's, it's, it's a, it's a fine balance act. And even to this, even to this day, I say, I'd never got that balance act right. Uh, you know, I pissed enough people off in my life. Uh, I got uh, to people that had no relevancies to conversations whatsoever as well, but it's. I guess you've cut your teeth in the agency world selling, you know, ultimately, you know, BDM in for you know, some big agencies in the UK, you've had a hell of a grounding in sort of translating the lingo to the businessman to obviously sell retainers in, in the space. So you've definitely um, probably got some serious skills there to, to uh, <laughs> I can only imagine, because obviously I've been doing this 12 years as well of explaining, you know, I had a chap in, um, in the office the other week, um, a similar sort of, you know, we've been working with him for a long, long time, but we work with his team. You know, and it, we really had to rein back the terminology. It was clear, just this body language. We were talking about, you know, audits and things. He's like, audit, you know, he just didn't. It's like, okay. So, you know, we sort of had to rein right back to sort of, right. So 18 months ago, we did this, 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 and that, that did that, and that did that. And, you know, local SEO is what it does that. It is, you know, just, it's just not on the ground with it. And, you know, it's one of the super uber sized business that's doing extremely, extremely well, you know, you know, and it's got a different team you know, that we're talking to, but in that instance, you know, we were talking to the owner and it was just, yeah, a whole different language has got to be used. And I think quite often that gets missed 
and then those owners stakeholders walk out at me and think i still have no clue you know and you just gotta you know rein it back haven't you and just make sure that terminology is is either cut out or it's, it's relating to you know whether the time money scenario sort of thing yeah yeah, brilliant. Right. So obviously Black & Decker, a lot of other sites you've worked on, um, e-com stores or work with, should I say. Um, what would you say is sort of a reoccurring theme of mistakes or a biggest mistake that you see a lot of stores making? You know, I think um, obviously this episode is going to go live soon after Christmas. So I think, um, you know, it, a lot of people will be listening to this thinking, oh, yeah, we made that. We did. We just lost a load of cash, <laughs> but we obviously did really well. Hopefully, as well. Yeah. What's, is there a, is there a reoccurring thing that you see that sort of grates you, gets you back up that you see? So this is a difficult one, man. Actually, because there's quite a few things that I look at, and um, it's actually just put put me off like the entire journey whatsoever. I was buying. Um, I won't mention the brand, but I was buying a um, a new basketball uh, jersey uh, the other day. And like the checkout process was just so long. I couldn't sign out as a, I couldn't yeah. sign in as a guest. Um, the delivery, uh, the delivery options were just an absolute nightmare. Um, I paid extra for next day delivery because I you know I've just started playing basketball again. And I thought, you know what, I can't just turn up in my old jersey. It's, it's <laughs> there that I know they, they expect me to have made something of myself, wear something nice. But yeah, I very similar to what you were talking about with the ring earlier. Um, uh, and it just didn't turn up. I paid extra for it, and it's a it's a massive, massive global brand. And you just yeah. think, what's what's gone wrong for them to to not say check out as guests? And I get obviously everyone's wanting to push yeah first party data. What I've seen people do really well is sign in and get an extra fifteen pounds off or fifteen percent off if you sign in with us yeah. on your next order. That was absolutely fantastic because we all know how big first party data is at the moment, and we've got to yeah. make sure we get it. Yeah. But if I want to sign out as a guest, because I'm never going to, I'm never going to shop with this place again, mostly because I wouldn't have shopped there to start off with. I tend, to, funnily enough, I tend to do most of my shopping on Amazon. Surprise, surprise. Um, but um, it was because my little sister had got me a gift voucher yeah. for them, and I yeah. said for my birthday, and I said, you know what, actually, I'm wanting to get back into basketball. She said, oh, you know what, I don't know what sizes you are. Here's a gift voucher for X brand. I know they do really good basketball tops. And after that, I was just like. It, I just couldn't couldn't get my head around it, and then even with the checkout process, it was it came to just a little bit more than the um, the the gift card was worth. Um, I think it was only like one pound forty seven or something daft like that. So trying to add my card oh, to it yeah. was just an absolute nightmare. It wouldn't accept the um, uh, you know people not accepting Google Pay, Apple Pay, yeah, or even Amazon Pay at the moment, yeah. and driving people through those. It just it just puts you off. That can obviously put you just then, then go to Amazon, don't you? If you can, you know, whereas obviously you want to, you want to support the independents and obviously very specific products that are, you know, on independent sites and whatnot. But yeah, that is, I'm, I'm with you there completely. You know, those checkout processes that are either, you know, they either they get clunky on mobile or they're just asking you for so much information and then you get there, they don't take various payment methods. They're just, you know, it's just credit card. You're like, oh man, come on, it's not 1987 anymore. No, exactly. I had to, I, I had to put my uh, my number in this site as well because, of, which was okay because you know they were going to give me text updates, and everything like that. And it's like, oh, we've already got um, a number associated on our account with you. And I was like, I've had the, I'm, I'm very old. I've had this same mobile number since I was like 12 or something stupid like that. And I've just had to continue on. Yeah, I know. Um, it's like, oh, maybe I bought them from the ages ago. And uh, I thought, right, okay, well, uh, you know, this is this is my only number. I'm not going to give you my work number. What, what, how am I supposed to proceed without without that? And you just think, I mean, can't as anyone in e-commerce will tell you, and you'll know this, Richard, um, that cart abandonment is the biggest killer in e-commerce. You know, you just see, what was it? I mean, 2020. I mean, what was it? I remember. I'm sure the stat that I read was somewhere between two and three billion was lost within cart abandonment, and you just think. That's money you can't afford to leave on the table. You've done the hard part. You've brought someone to your brand. You've got them in your product. You've got it in the basket. And it's just, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, to me, yeah. it's just, it's it's worse than an own goal. Yeah. Because you, you've gone from, you know, you're just about to, to put it in yourself, but then you've just sent it the other way up the pitch. Yeah, no, I think um, the guys that are with us, you all know how good that checkout is. And if you're honest with yourselves, 
I think um, you know a lot of you that could um, improve things, you know, and that especially that abandoned checkout piece, you know, the follow ups, the things you can do with your remarketing, the things you can do with your email marketing. You know, that's that's if you have lost the the, the cart. But obviously, just making sure that the different payment options are there, the mobile options at work, and things like that. So, okay, well, it's been an absolute blast, Dan. I've got a couple of couple of questions left at the end um, for you. Um, so, crystal ball time. We're sat here in eighteen months' time. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is the next sort of biggest thing for e-com? And is there anything sort of coming down the pipe? Sort of a double-edged question, really. Ooh. Next biggest thing in the space that you think is coming? And is there so many, any sort of um, any sort of insider info you can give us that's coming also down the pipeline for Black & Decker? So the industry and Black & Decker, or is it the same thing? <laughs> uh, the, yeah, there's two separate answers for you there. I can tell you this. I was just double-checking, actually, if I could tell you this. But I think <laughs> I saw an article on it in Forbes a couple of weeks ago but I'll have to double check but no I'm, I'm confident I can tell you because I'm having a lot of conversations about it at the moment so for Stanley Black & Decker we are just about to uh, release our uh, fully recycled range so it's a product called Reviva uh, yeah. it's made from fully recycled products and it can be recycled at the end of its use as well uh, we come with the instructions and the packaging is all fully recyclable wow. as well wow. but it's not lost the, lost the power of your standard Black & Decker product as well so it's still just as powerful but it's still doing the job but it's fully recyclable and that's, that's amazing me, uh, that to me is the biggest thing it's uh, and it's, it surprised me when I, th- I found out that no one else in the market is doing this especially with the big boom that we had before you've got you know everyone's looking into diy at the moment uh, i can't see that wanting to go away because i've kind of got into it even though i was very much the guy who was like right it'll cost me this much to do it myself <laughs> plus this much time plus the amount I have to get my uh, my mum to come and fix it for me because she's the one. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're about. She's, yeah. Well, she's she's funnily enough, she's had the Walt target because she's been doing you know she, you know she's a single mum raised three of us by herself. She has been doing DIY uh, for decades, and she's a, a massive DeWalt user because she's got the she's borderline professional. She, you know, bless her, she's 65 years old. <laughs> I hope she's 65 years old. That's gonna be awkward if I can't remember that. <laughs> but you know she. As you know, she replastered her house, she uh, built walls, she's built gates and stuff. You know, she, yeah, yeah. She to me is like the epitome. If I could record her for a DeWalt session, I'd just say, right, that's that's the full training that I need. Whereas I'm the, the the standard. Someone bought me a hammer drill and I put it into a bit of plaster wall and thinking that uh, oh, I need it on max power. I ended up ripping half my wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. But, yeah. yeah but the, with the big boom in DIY at the moment, um, sustainability needs yeah. to be on everyone I know, I know it sounds like i'm very preachy very political but sustainability needs to be on everyone's mind and it needs to be pushed um i'm just shocked that uh i mean i'm thankful that i'm part of a company that's jumped first but i'm just shocked that we have yeah. jumped first in that it's, that's it's nice. yeah yeah it's, brilliant. It's really worth it. the, the last thing for the entirety of the industry um this is something that we were working on back at branded three uh with one of our sister ba- uh, sister brands i've completely forgotten what the name is i've got I've just got reviva stuck in my head <laughs> um but working in terms of augmented reality now whether this is at home um will it will it impact the diy sphere probably not but in terms of furniture versus yeah. clothing now the, the yeah. clothing as- aspect of it i think it should be biggest in because with augmented reality the plan was to try and uh, show someone what it was like, what they were on. Now, this plan was pre-COVID, so this is when people were in shops. So, what does this dress look like? On? Yeah. yeah. Um, can I have it in different colours? What would it look like in a different size? If I couldn't have it, could I order it to be delivered or click and collect on those sort of lines? Just having uh, AR-inspired mirrors, well, even with like phone technology at the moment, uh, it could be done along there. Yeah. And I imagine in terms of trying to get people down that funnel, people don't really know you know uh, one thing that i know uh, from my other half is that she's always really worried about what the fit will look like on her and this is why it's really uh yeah. from buying from uh from anyone because she doesn't know what the fit's gonna be yeah yeah, yeah. So looking at looking at that it's a case of right okay what sort of fit is what would it look better in this color you know yeah. you, know, you yeah. can wear the full outfit that you want to wear with so you walk in a store potentially as well like so i get get in that um multi-channel you could walk in a store you scan a qr code and bang you see that dress on yeah. you because you're your presets in that account potentially yeah. for that company in the app know your size know your your own quirks of your body or whatever it may be exactly. you know, obviously I'm, I'm a big guy you know i can't i'm exactly the same as you are i think in terms of sizing you know i can't walk in a shop and buy you know my standard size because I'm a six foot seven, rather 
muscular not really but <laughs> guy so it's tricky it's tricky to walk mm. it so but if if those apps and the, the tech have got your sizing you know you can get a lot more accurate you know and as you're walking around a store potentially you're seeing certain ads based on your activity a bit like you know that that on-site experience based on your activity on the site and sort of the two coming together yeah exactly. I love it. and love then it. and then using shadow profiles to sort of mix the in-store uh retail experience with uh, you're online as well. Um, a bit more difficult with GDPR coming through, but creating a shadow file that then disappears when you walk out the store, uh, measuring your reactions to different clothes as you go through. So when you're going through, actually say, looking at people's reactions was part of the plan to sort of see how they reacted with a piece of clothing, if it was a positive reaction or if it was a negative yeah, reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To then say, uh, go to this sort of Amazon, would you also be interested in this? Look what, how this looks like with this as well yeah. so being able to pick yeah. it up that, that to me is what uh retail really needs at the moment to keep it alive because it's really yeah. i mean it's had the worst two years i've seen i can i can remember and i mean definitely in my lifetime yeah um to work with it but it's, it's trying to mix uh the two because you know for me i don't know what a sofa is going to look like yeah in my room. uh if it's set up is it going to fit you know you can yeah. do the measuring tape thing but you don't actually know what it looks like Yes, so it's there, and that's where the augmented reality augmented is really and that, that true omni channel. Yeah, brilliant. Exactly. So we are at that time. I like to always ask for a book recommendation. Any book, if you were to recommend one book to our listeners, what would it be? There's two. One's a very, very pretentious one, but I basically lived my life from it from when I was 18, uh, and that was uh, Sun Tzu's uh, The Art of War. Okay. Uh, yeah. But in terms of a leisurely read and a non-pretentious answer, I'm just trying to double check who <laughs> the author was. Um, was uh, the historian? Oh, uh, really, really a uh, book by Elizabeth Koska. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to massacre her name. Sorry, Elizabeth, if you if you do watch this, but uh, K O S T O V A Kostova, I think it is. I'm, I'm when I'm doing my yeah. uh, Semrush webinars. Uh, I always mangle people's names for shout outs. I try my absolute best, but uh, typical British is just can't read anything that's not uh -oh. uh, standard. And you think being half Arabic, I'd be I'd be <laughs> all right with the difficult names. You know, my uh, my name, you know, that I changed before I became Dan um, was, you know, that had a lot of R's and had a lot of roles to it. But no, ask anyone's name that I don't come across every day. I just lose it. But <laughs> really brilliant book, really uh, uh, so, uh really brought me into it really sucked me into it because a lot of times and as you'll appreciate we we very rarely get time to sort of sit with a good book and sort of go through it yeah. but this really caught my attention all the way through and even to the end i was like oh, there's gonna be a sequel out for it but the, there just wasn't and oh, brilliant. I, brilliant. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll um we'll link that up but thank you very much for being on the show that has been a whirlwind, an absolute blast. Lots of brilliant takeaways there from the front line. Obviously, I, I love the, the sort of agency background into, you know, it, you know work, working at Black & Decker. Brilliant. Now, for the guys that are listening that want to find out more about you and, and maybe reach out to you, what, what's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, best way uh, for me is on uh, LinkedIn at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Dan Saunders, it's me and my dog up there, or at Dan Saunders 86 on Twitter. Okay. I mean, alternatively, if you want to email me, it's uh, daniel.saunders at sbdinc.com. sbdinc.com. Well, thank you for being on the show. Have a brilliant day.